So my talk, which is actually co-written by myself and my wife, Shelly Maycock, and my, my kitten is getting into trouble in the background. So uh, bear with me on that point. Uh, our talk is called With Whom the Graver Had a Strife, the First Folio and the Spanish Marriage Crisis. And I want to begin by thanking both the De Beers Society and the Shakespeare Authorship Trust for their uh, support of this presentation. And I hope that uh, everyone finds it to be educational and useful. To start from the characters, this talk is about how it happened that these three persons pictured here figured in the genesis of the book known as the first folio, William Shakespeare's comedies, histories, and tragedies. They are, from left to right, uh, Prince Charles Stuart, Prince of Wales, uh, in the middle, the Spanish Infanta Maria Ana, and um, on the far right side, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, in the so-called Ashbourne portrait. So let's begin with a little bit of a literature review. Um, the so-called Spanish marriage crisis has long been a mysterious episode in English history. An embarrassment to Protestant historians, it was easily overlooked, if not long kept in a closet by the time Thomas Cogswell in 1989 revived the study of S.R. Gardner in the late 19th century. <laughs> Peter Dixon, in 1996, uh, having been alerted, I believe, to the importance of this event by uh, Professor Cogswell, uh, first linked in a tangible way the first folio production to the Spanish marriage, uh, especially through a series of three, I believe, lectures that he delivered at uh, the Library of Congress in the mid-1990s. Um, the third point I want to mention here is my own 1998 article in response to Dixon, which showed through the 1619 publication, Treasury of Ancient Riches, Archeo Plutos, that there is a tangible connection in the years leading up to the folio between Jaggard and the lady Susan Beer and her husband, the Earl of Montgomery. Um, so, um, Dixon had linked the first folio production to the Spanish match primarily through, uh, the fact that there is this close coincidence in the timing between the imprisonment of Henry de Vere, the 18th Earl of Oxford, and the months of production of the folio. Uh, Finally, uh, uh, Anderson, M.K. Anderson, in his very important book, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, uh, prominently cites uh, Peter Dixon's hypothesis uh, regarding a connection between the folio and the Spanish marriage. And to just bring this up more to the present here, by around 2015, uh, Oxford professor Emma Smith and other Orthodox scholars had begun to respond by referring to the Spanish match, usually, if not inevitably, without mentioning Peter Dixon or any of the other researchers that I have mentioned so far. More recently, Gabriel Reedy, an Oxfordian scholar has published several articles on the folio and its relation to the marriage crisis in the Oxfordian and other places. And perhaps this is a point for me to plug this book, the Shakespeare uh, folio, the first folio of Shakespearean enigma, the 1623 first folio and the authorship question. Um, this is a book that I have just uh, had the good fortune to serve as the editor for, and it includes, um, gosh, I don't know exactly how many there are, but close to maybe almost 20 articles and book reviews on the first folio by um, Gabriel Reedy, uh, Shelley Maycock, uh, Bill Boyle, myself, Richard Whalen, John Rollett, Mike Hyde, Alexander Waugh. Bonner Cutting, Catherine Children, and Heidi Janch. 
And I think I already mentioned Catherine Children, but in case I missed her, um, a couple of things by Catherine Children. So this is, I think, quite a useful uh, book. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in my talk is here in the book including uh, this article by Gabriel Reedy and a couple of other articles by Gabriel Reedy as well. And then just to bring this down to the present, Chris Torres finally in 2023 in his book, Shakespeare's uh, uh, Book, which is effectively the official Shakespeare Industrial Complex uh, book, the most important one anyway on the Shakespeare First Folio, has really gone completely in for the idea of some type of a connection between the marriage crisis and the folio. Again, however, unfortunately, without mentioning the present tense context of those claims and the fact that he is in effect responding to, without admitting it, uh, the uh, people like uh, Peter Dixon uh, and Gabriel Reedy. So there's a lot of text on this slide, and I'm not going to spend a long time on it. I went through it and gave you in red some of the key points. So let's just quickly cover those. In March of 1621, King Philip of Spain dies, and this clears the way to accelerate plans for the Spanish match. Meanwhile, in Central Europe, the Upper Palatinate is seized by the Duke of Bavaria, and by April, in April 1622, approximately coincident with the beginning of the publishing of the folio, uh, Henry de Vere is in prison for opposing the Spanish match. Uh, in March of 1623, Charles and Buckingham arrive in Spain, and they're going to return only uh, in October, approximately coincident with the first publication of the folio and just before Henry de Vere is released from the tower. And of course, after all of this, <laughs> after going to Spain to uh, to effect a marriage and it doesn't work and Charles and Buckingham come back and what do they do? They call for war with Spain. <laughs> so this is a crazy, crazy world. Um, so probably the most important protagonist, though, in all this is, is James VI of Scotland and, and the first of England. Um, it's James is often criticized, and not without reason, for many uh, failings of policy and character. But uh, to give him a break, he came to the English throne during the Anglo-Spanish War after it had been going on for 20 years and he was already, the crown was already heavily in debt. And what does he do right away? He made peace with Spain. So if you think that peace is generally better than war, then you got to give James some props here. He inherited a culture war. Bashing the Spanish was common in the wake of this war. And other long-term sources of enmity and dislike that persisted. Uh, on the other hand, it's very important for us to realize that Hispanic culture, especially picaresque and satire literature, satirical literature, was quite popular in England, and for good reason. It was brilliant comic stuff. To wrap this up on a note about James, though, he was notoriously susceptible to the influence of his male favorites and often expressed contempt towards women, both of which caused some problems in his management of the realm. Um, the Spanish match idea, in part, originated in Queen Anne's, his, his wife's plan to marry Prince Henry. Uh, to the Spanish Infanta. This was part of her lifetime effort to regain and retain influence over her son, whom James had taken away from her immediately after his birth. And first campaign for marrying Henry to the Spanish Princess Maria Anna in 1612. But when Henry died, Charles replaced Henry as the prospective husband of the Spanish Infanta. And pardon me, I sort of screwed up my timing on the bullet points here, but it's important 
before we move on to Charles to dwell on this for a minute, she cultivated her first son Henry's love for Elizabethan literature and drama. Much more than James. Earl, what are you doing? You need to not do that right now, honey. One second. Okay, sweetie. Okay, here we go. Come on, come on, come on. We're going to go out. We're going to go out. I'm going to give you this out here. Pardon me. Where were we? Oops, I got to shut the door. That way, I'll be able to focus a little bit better. So, they did love, she and, and Henry were the big aficionados of the theater, really, in the Jacobean court, more than James, I believe, uh, and were probably responsible for the two major revivals of Shakespeare plays at court in 1605 and um, in 1612. She died in 1619. Um, and after Henry and Anne were gone, partly due to these personal tragedies, James became ever more dependent on his favorites and desperate to complete his perhaps rather naive ideal of ending religious strife in Europe by using his children as pawns. So... I already mentioned that Henry died young, and here he is. Uh, he, he died in 1612. And uh, so the queens planned to marry him to the uh, Spanish heir, died with him, and Charles replaced Henry as the prospective husband of the Spanish Infanta. Henry's death delayed and cast a pall over the wedding of his sister, Elizabeth Stewart, in 1613, whose marriage to the Frederick V, who would become the king of Bohemia in 1620, um, uh, was seen as a dynastic sealing of the alliance between the Protestants uh, uh, inside a Bavarian state, inside the Holy Roman Emperor and England, a pact and a clear signal against increasing Catholic and Habsburg power in Europe. And so it was euphorically celebrated by the Protestant public. Uh, sometimes known as the Winter Queen because her Protestant husband was overthrown by Ferdinand, the German Habsburg Emperor, after reigning for only one year as the so-called Winter King of Bohemia, Elizabeth with her husband was forced to flee to Prague, from Prague to The Hague because their former Palatinate home had fallen to Catholic armies. Their appeal to aid from James was one reason that James hoped the Spanish match for Charles might give him leverage over the fate of his daughter's kingdom. It was an idealistic idea, but not too realistic. So with Henry gone and Elizabeth married to the Protestants, uh, Charles Stuart, the second son and heir to James I, was in 1613 first brooded as a, a possible uh, new uh, marriage partner for the uh, Habsburg heir, Anna Maria. Uh, he didn't marry her. Instead, in May of 1625, he married another Catholic princess, the French Princess Henrietta Maria. And of course, he succeeded as Charles I on, in 1625 on the death of James. Another really important figure here that we must bring into our story is Diego Sarmiento de Acuña, Count of Gondomar who came to prominence in the Spanish court fighting against Drake. So he was familiar with and hostile to the English naval privateering and colonial projects that had endangered Spain's empire building and further ambitions. He encouraged James to turn to a pro-Spanish policy. 
Shortly after his 1613 installation, Gondomar proposed that James settle his financial problems that had led him to unprecedented conflicts with Parliament by marrying Charles to the Spanish Infanta, who would bring, he uh, promised, a dowry of 500,000 pounds. Not only world peace, but financial prosperity. After first successfully urging James to execute the national hero, Sir Walter Raleigh, on a charge of piracy in 1618, Gondomar, in a 1621 letter recovered by Peter Dixon, relates to King Philip III his intent to see Henry de Vere, then in the tower, uh, for opposing the match, to receive the same penalty. So while English Protestants were skeptical of the politics of this idea, let us remember that the more literary appreciated Spanish literature and arts, especially picaresque and satire. In 1623 alone, partly in response to the brouhaha over the possibility of the marriage, there were approximately 30 English translation of Spanish texts produced in England. And George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham, is the next in our lineup of really important figures here. He is James's handsome favorite in his later years. And Ben Jonson, uh, to please King James in his masks, was not above displaying Villiers' talents for dancing and flattering entertainment. And most importantly, it is George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, who joins Charles on the trip to Spain in 1623 in the spring, hoping that they can together charm Anna Maria. On the other side in all of this are uh, several who I will now introduce you to, starting with Henry de Vere, the 18th Earl of Oxford, the son and heir of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. He was an outspoken opponent of the match. So much so that he was arrested and jailed twice in the years 1621 to 23 for his opposition to the match. Along with him, Henry Rosely, third Earl of Southampton and Sir Edwin Sandys. Along with Oxford, the sixth Earl of Derby, William Stanley and John Selden, Southampton and Sandys were two key members of the Patriot activists against the match. Sandys was a principal author of the 1621 protestation from the House of Commons against the match, a piece of writing that so enraged King James that he himself physically tore the protestations out of the House of Commons journal with his own hands. Both these men were, like Oxford and Derby's chaplain, John Everard, arrested over their uh, opposition to the marriage. And finally, in this lineup, let us not fail to include the two sons of Mary Sidney, who were among the more moderate centrist opponents of the marriage, as well as being the two dedicatees of the 1623 folio. Philip, the uh, uh, younger brother, in 1605 had married Susan Beer. His older brother, William, had been proposed in marriage for Susan's older sister, Bridget. The Herberts and the De Veres were thus closely allied by marriage and interest. Uh, Pembroke, with ties to the De Veres and a major first folio patron, was uh, outspokenly against the Spanish match and was instrumental in the folio. In 1615, after turning down several less desirable posts, he had received the position of Lord Chamberlain of the Royal Household, which made him the chief theatrical authority in England. 
in 1619, after the pavier quartos of some Shakespeare plays appear, there was controversy over the rights to those plays. Pembroke issued an injunction against the further publishing of plays owned by the King's men. Pembroke's chaplain, Thomas Scott, also was heavily involved in the political polemics against the Spanish match and actually had to flee England at one point to avoid imprisonment. And as I've already mentioned, William's brother Philip, also pictured here, was married to Susan de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford's youngest daughter. So Shelley is always reminding me of the importance of looking at the big picture, the big historical picture. So I just want to really quickly, again, there's a lot of text on this slide, but let's just go over a few of the things that make up the larger historical context of what is happening here in the 1620s. Um, uh, by 1621, England and Spain have centuries of relationship, good and bad. Uh, friendly and unfriendly, uh, uh, collaborative and competitive, and sometimes open war. So the background goes all the way back to the medieval Anglo-Hispanic and Anglo-Portuguese relations, and we're talking the long view history of European politics. Some of the old wounds are renewed in 1572, when the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre of Protestants in Paris by the Catholic League and the Medicis kills thousands of Protestants in one day in and around Paris. And this is in response to the interfaith marriage of Margot de Medici and Henry of Navarre. Following this event, years of war between England and Spain would ensue. The 1588 Armada, where Spain actually attempted to send ships to conquer England, was another reminder that the Spanish monarchy would conquer by force of arms if it needed to. Previous Spanish marriage alliances had not gone well in the past. Henry VIII and Catherine and Mary Tudor and Philip, neither of them uh, produced uh, viable children. Uh, James wanted a middle way. He was a guy who liked being in the center of everything, including religion and gender, but it was debatable for him what the center meant. The backers of the first folio, by contrast, supported Spanish writers against the Inquisition, but favored detente, not peace, with Spain. So, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, from this big picture, want to zoom back in here on this one uh, important article by Alexander Sampson, uh, one of uh, several really fine uh, writers on the Spanish match, uh, historians. Um, his article, A Fine Romance, Anglo-Spanish -Sp Relations in the 16th Century, um, uh, states, and I, I think that this is a quotation, and what I've done in the bullet points is to pull out and take the make the quotation into bulleted uh, uh, points. The complexity of English responses to Spain in the 16th century needs to be seen in the context of England's admiration, envy, and fear of Western Europe's most powerful state. The evolution from celebrating Spanish colonial success, whatever the methods used to gain it, to denouncing Spain's cruelty and tyranny, was stimulated by Spain's expansionist imperial aspirations that had begun to threaten England directly. Religious difference was merely one of a number of factors dividing the rivalry between the two countries. The perception of closeness and filiation ran parallel with enmity and hate. England's cultural Hispanophilia should be distinguished from the anti-Spanish sentiment that increasingly characterized English reactions to the Spanish on a political and religious level and the gulf between elite and popular responses to Spain should be recognized. 
And of course, above all, different strata and cultural subgroups of English society, as in any society, saw James's ambitions differently. By 1619, the impetus seemed to be brewing towards the collected works of Shakespeare in the form of the so-called Pavier Quartos, which we have previously mentioned. Uh, as the issue of the Spanish match became more urgent in the years leading to the folio's production, so there were clear signs of a negotiation that was ongoing between the grand possessors of the folio manuscripts and the Jaggard publishing firm. In late 1619, William Jaggard published a translation of Archaeo Plutos, the Treasury of Ancient Riches, dedicated to Philip and Susan urging them to bestow how and when you list. And you can see here, this is to Philip Herbert, Knight of the Bath, and also to the truly virtuous and noble countess's wife, the Lady Susan, daughter to the Honorable Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxenford. Um, and finally, not only is this a dedication, uh, you know, four years uh, in advance to the Lady Susan Vere, but it is begging the... Uh, uh, the the lady and her husband to bestow how and when you list, which certainly sounds like a public appeal to proceed with the production of the folio. And on top of all this, we can see from the comparison side by side here, here is Archeo Plutos, here is the first folio, that the folio is essentially echoing semiotically in its design, the 1619 publication. So let us now talk for a few minutes about Ben Jonson. Really, in many ways, the most important figure in this whole story, the one we haven't really dealt with yet. Jonson was patronized and supported by Pembroke since at least 1605. He authored uh, pro-Spanish court masks for James, including the highly successful 1621 Gypsies metamorphosed and i'll have something to say about gypsies in just a minute around 1621 in his masks he adopts a theme of disguise that is uh continuous in at least two of the masks back to back he was instrumental in the design and production of the first folio and he penned and orchestrated the first folio prefaces including the mock encomium and his revelatory epigram to the reader that goes with the Drozhout engraving. In the final lines of his 1621 Gypsies Metamorphose, Johnson jokes about the dissimulation of the prince and Buckingham's plan to go to Spain in disguise and also foreshadows the disguise, I would argue, of the first folio's Drozhout engraving. Who doth disguise his habit and his face and takes on a false person by his place? The power of poetry can never fail her, assisted by a barber and a tailor. Gypsy was a literary cant term for player or perhaps a playwright. Both the barber and the tailor would help Johnson with the Drozhout engraving. But before we get to that, we've got Mask of Augers in 1622. In the anti-mask of this uh, mask in 1622, a group of spirited rustic actors, sort of like the mechanicals in Midsummer Night's Dream, are seeking entrance to the king, only to be blocked by an officious busybody named the Groom of the Revels, a public official, in other words. Not the leader of the actors says, our desire is to only know whether the king's majesty and the court expect any disguise here tonight. Disguise? What mean you by that? Do you think his majesty sits here to expect drunkards? Disguise was the old English word for a mask, sir, before you were an implement belonging to the revels. Ah, no such word in the office now, I assure you, sir. Now, you might wish to recall that Johnson himself had recently been passed over by Pembroke for the office of the Master of the Revels, and 
it was the position he greatly coveted. And the Johnson is here poking fun at Sir John Astley, Pembroke's cousin, who had beaten Johnson out for the post for not knowing anything supposedly about the history of theatrical disguises. Well, um, there's a long history of seeing disguise in the first folio, a long history of seeing the Drozhout engraving as a mask and a draw joke. Um, I'm just going to refer you here in this slide. This is These are the two things that I have done that are readily accessible on YouTube, poetic form as code in the first folio. And this is the order that they're perhaps best viewed in. Witty numbers, Ben Johnson's Shakespeare first folio in jest. Uh, so um, those are uh, some places to go to find out more about exactly what these two pages in the folio are doing and, and, and how we might pay attention to them. But uh, to continue with the concept of the Spanish match more specifically here, um, uh, the the uh, uh, match is mirrored in the paratexts of the first folio. Paratexts are the introductory matter of a book, from title pages to dedication, dedications or dedicatory verses. So there's at least a couple things in the paratext that are connect the book to the marriage crisis. The first is that it employs a Dutch type. Okay, that's important because the war is basically the Dutch Protestants are a leading part of the uh, Protestant battle against uh, Habsburg Catholic domination in Europe. So the book employs a Dutch type to print Johnson's 10 line epigram imitating a Spanish genre of satire, the decima, two examples of which occur in introductory poems to Don Quixote, one of them to the Don's horse, Rocinante, Nag of Nags. And here's a shout out to anybody who is a fan of The Expanse, a wonderful science fiction series in which the name of the ship of the heroes is called the Rocinante, Nag of Nags. And I should also thank Gabriel Reedy because actually I should have given him a, a, a citation here because he has done the original work on this. So this um, of, of the, the Don Quixote part, um, the, the Johnson's epigram of 10 lines is followed by his 80 line triumph, which imitates the triumphal elements of Charles and Buckingham's amorous touring in Spain. The news reports were full of triumphs from Spain. In addition to the paratext of the folio, the first folio in the arrangement of the plays also reflects the impact of the Spanish marriage crisis. It opens with a play about Spain. Now, I know you may be thinking Milan and Naples are not Spain, but for much of the 15th century, they were. And the folios educated readers would have known that. The last play in the folio is Cymbeline, a play about power struggles between a native English uh, power structure and the would-be dominators of the Roman Empire. It ends with a declaration of peace between England and Rome, but on England's terms. And more specifically, it includes the line, and now publish we this peace. The peace between Rome and England will be ratified by publication which would seem to be self-referential to the folio itself. So um, I've just got a couple more slides here, and I want to mention one of Gabriel Reedy's most interesting and challenging concepts in some of the, what he, the work he's been doing is the idea of the first folio as a gift. And uh, if I may do the best I can to summarize Reedy's thinking is this is the idea of that the folio is, um, although it requires money to produce it, that it's not primarily a commercial product, but it was designed as a gift. And the reasoning is that the Earl of Oxford's thousand pound annuity 
uh, essentially had purchased the crown, the ownership of the plays. Hence, they were the plays of the king's men, of course. Now, Reedy even suggests that possibly the overarching intent and metaphor was of a wedding gift for Charles and Anna Maria. Um, uh, I'm a little skeptical of that aspect of the argument, but I find the concept of the folio and a gift economy being a very, very important one. And Reedy points to the epilogue of Henry IV, which falls exactly at or near, anyway, the center of the first folio, and sees in that evidence supporting this theory of the folio as a gift. Um, if uh, any of this is correct, uh, even just the first part. That would explain why Pembroke had been so anxious to obtain and hold on to the position of Lord Chamberlain of the royal household, uh, something that since Ogburn onwards, uh, a number of people, including Chris, Chris Latouris, most recently have emphasized. One of the Lord Chamberlain's traditional duties was to hire the master of the revels and oversee the management of theater in the kingdom. And this would have included the power to make critical decisions, including when and how to publish the collected works of Shakespeare. An alternative to seeing it as a uh, as a straight gift is that uh, it's in effect a satirical gift uh, for uh, the marriage of Charles and his bride, and that seems to be to, to me to be more consistent with our understanding of the perspective and beliefs and ideologies of the main backers of it who were not in the main supporters of the marriage. So I just want to conclude here with a few critical questions. There's a lot we don't know about the first folio still and its context. And so here are a few things to continue thinking about. How did the publication of the folio relate to Henry's imprisonment for opposing the Spanish match? Was it instrumental to his release? exactly what was going on there. We don't know. All we know is there's a very close coincidence in timing between these two events. Was the folio viewed as a symbolic or a literal gift for Charles and his bride, or was it a mock gift? Or was it a message to James and Charles warning against future censorship? Was the folio holding up Shakespeare as the ultimate cultural and satirical expression of English culture in the face of a prospective Habsburg alliance that would make England subject to censorship and the Inquisition? How can we better explain the roles of the Hispanophilic editors of the first folio, Blount, Diggs, and Maybe, in their promotion of Spanish literature, something I really didn't cover in this talk, but which you can read about elsewhere, that satirized its culture in parallel to Shakespeare's own satirical wit. What further levels of innuendo or code talking are in the folio, and how can we distinguish plausible hypotheses about encryptions from plausible ones? So let me just end with those questions. This is my work cited page. Um, I think everything or almost everything that was influential for the talk is uh, available for you here. Again, I wanna thank the De Beer Society and the Shakespeare Authorship Trust for the chance to present. I hope I haven't gone on for too long. I look forward to any questions that you may have uh, regarding this presentation.